1971 war die Welt in Bewegung. Aber da bei uns war es, als würde sie stillstehen. And of course, when I knew it, but then when I started to research, I found out that there is a 100-year-old history of women fighting for this right. You know, it wasn't like they were sitting back and just waiting. They were really fighting, putting in motions and, and petitions, and, um, and they were turned down over and over again. And 1959, they voted for the first time. Switzerland is a direct democracy, so the men voted on it. Mm -hmm. And they turned it down 60 to 40 percent. It was a huge setback for the women and a huge humiliation. 59 was already so late, yeah. you know, like all the countries around had yeah. the right to vote. It was very personal because they were probably married to a guy who voted Abs against it. Absolutely. Right? It was extremely personal and extremely humiliating to live in a, in a country that says we're one of the oldest democracies and Switzerland actually wasn't a democracy until 1971 when women also got the right to vote. Yes. But after 59, it took another 12 years to, to, you know, to bring this to the ballots again. And even then, like the antagonist you see in the movie the, is a woman, and there were these very strong organizations who were still rooting against this, who, didn't, who said it's against the divine order. God doesn't, women, doesn't want women to be in politics. God has created the world with clearly assigned roles, and if we mix up that order, it's apocalypse. Wie findest du, wenn ich wieder ein bisschen arbeiten will? Mir ist das wichtiger als unsere Familie. Und ohne meine Zustimmung kannst du auch gar nicht. So ist das Gesetz. Frauen in der Politik, meine lieben Damen, ist schlichtweg gegen die göttliche Ahnung. Nein. Ich bin nämlich fürs Frauenstimmrecht. Zum Glück ist ihre Meinung nicht ausschlaggebend. Women act against their own interest. We can see it today, we can see how people voted you know, in the, in the elections. Um, we can see it how people vote in other countries, also in Germany and Switzerland, where there's also a strong uh, movement towards the right, and the right usually always tries to take away the rights from women. Um, but in the 70s in Switzerland, they were very educated women. Most of them had studies at universities. They were pharmacists, doctors, lawyers. But they usually also had rich husbands. They were very bourgeois women. So they were already in a position of power. And women are not better people per se. They were also afraid of losing their power and influence. And so they tried to convince the other women, especially working class women, that they wouldn't need that, that kind of uh, political right. Mm -hmm. And they were really, like, they were turning the whole argument around. They would say, like, we women, we are so special, and we have our specially assigned roles. And if we also want to do politics now, that diminishes our role. You know, it makes us, it makes us, uh, defic that it, it makes it seem as if we were deficient, like we were not enough with what we do. Mm. So they kind of turned it around and said, we should be proud, you know, of, you know, how we take care of the family, our yeah. business is the internal business, the caring business, and men have to take care of dirty politics. I see. So it was almost like there was a view of um, where women could be revered and where they were comfortable with where the, where they were in the society in that order yes. as well. And, um, and also that it had value, you yes. know, and they said if women do politics, it devalues women. I see that. It was actually mm -hmm. stuff that was below them. And, exactly. And how did you do the research for this? You mentioned somewhere that um, the political is personal, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there was a lot of historical materials, but how did you make it personal? Because there's a real personal edge to this movie mm -hmm. as well. I mean, you know, when we had the idea to make a movie about the women's right to vote, in Switzerland, that's a very conceptual idea. You don't have characters, you don't have a yes. story, you don't have a perspective. And what I always do, and that's maybe my almost favorite part in the beginning before I start writing, I, I really open myself up and then do a really extensive research. I read everything from these times. I, of course, read all the, a lot of American feminists. I read Betty Friedan, and I read um, Marilyn French's novel, um, A Room for a Woman, I think, A Woman's Room. Yeah. And then I, I met with a lot of feminists in Switzerland, old ladies who had dedicated their whole lives um, to, you know, women's rights and I read about the women's movement in Switzerland and I found out that we learn nothing about this in school. We learn about all these battles that the brave Swiss fought on this mountain, on that mountain against the Germans, but we don't learn how Swiss women for 100 years fought for the right to vote and that they were 
extremely organized and, and internationally connected. And it was like a parallel society of like politically active women, but didn't have any political rights. Yes. And I was so fascinated. And then little by little, I started also, I started to see how marital law was connected to this because marital law was really um, oppressing women in Switzerland until 1988, actually. So they couldn't get a job without their husband's permission. They couldn't open bank accounts and stuff like that. And of course, because they couldn't vote, they couldn't change these laws. So I thought I really want to show how in, in many how in many ways women were oppressed by the law and, and create this cosmos of women, this kaleidoscope of women in different ages, um, you know, realizing that this is not okay and becoming rebels. And the actual inspiration for Nora came from, I found in a women's archive of Marte Gosteli, who was like one of the biggest uh, fighters for women's rights in Switzerland. She actually just recently died and she became almost 100 years old. And I had the luck to meet her in her archive. And she was the most amazing, strong woman I've, I've met on my journey with this research. müssen unsere Vaginas kennenlernen. The eye of God. Was hast du gesagt? Nee, das ist schon etwas Blasphemisches. Also. interesting is there is a lot of conversations now especially in Silicon Valley about women in tech mm. and we were just talking yesterday about women in the film industry and I thought very insightful in your film was this idea that it's not just equality in the industry it's equality in the marriage and the family life because both of them are connected mm. and a lot of what is challenging about you know doing all the things you need to do in industry is also that relationship you have with your support system your mm. family and yeah. your your spouse so yeah if you don't find a good regulation as a woman with your spouse and you have kids a lot of marriages fall back into the 50s it's a reality you know even though young women now think i heard a lot of young women in the course of like showing the film they were like oh we are so over this you know i'm gonna be free i'm gonna do what i want and i said wait until you're married and have kids it's gonna be a different question because um em employers don't um, support uh, they don't support the idea that not only the man is like the money earner they all there's there's still this deep assumption that mommy stays home with the kids mm -hmm. And the, and the mothers do, even if they both work 100%, there, there's statistics and data now that women still do a lot more care work at home. They do a lot more household, they do more, a lot more uh, of emotional care. And that's labor. Yeah. And, um, and, and it's true, if you have to work so much at home, of course that influences your career possibilities. So let's talk about you as a director, as a writer, as an artist. Um, and what was interesting yesterday was um, you mentioned this comment about um, equality, but also about being able to have uh, the freedom to sometimes be mediocre, that mm -hmm. it's a hard process mm -hmm. to go through, to be an artist, to um, create things. Uh, what has really, um, how, where do you find your confidence? Where do you find, um, I mean, I just looked at, the stuff you've you've done, right? You write your pieces, you direct. It's a hard industry to be in. Mm. Where do you find that source of confidence, inspiration? I think it's something that really grew, you know, because I I didn't fall from the sky as a genius, and I think very few people do actually. There is this idea of the artist, like you know, God-made creature that immediately makes <laughs> wonderful pieces of art. And I think you know, I grew up in a totally working-class family. My mother is a secretary. My father is a factory worker. So not Italian. from the industry, nothing. No, right? my yeah. father is like he came as a migrant from it, like super poor Italy. He hardly had any schooling. He grew up on a farm he came to Switzerland to find work he fell in love with the baker's daughter which was a big scandal in the village of course in the Swiss village the, you know yeah. this Italian who snatches up the blonde yeah. baker's daughter yeah. even even <laughs> now when I've been in, I've, I've go to, I've been to Switzerland yes. there's still those little towns that are very much still yeah, yeah. The, there's a baker's daughter yeah, yeah yeah it's still like this like time stands a little bit still in Switzerland yeah. in certain places so I didn't you know I never thought as a little girl that I could ever make movies mm -hmm. like I loved movies always always, always, but it was beyond my horizon that I could be somebody making a movie. It, it just didn't occur to me. 
And then a little later, I, th I thought I want to do something creative. And then my parents would say, yeah, become a hairdresser. That's creative. That's their, that was their world. It wasn't yeah. because they're, you yeah. know, didn't my want My parents me. was become an accountant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's like, you know, parents have these ideas. And then when I actually went to art school, they were really scared. They thought I will end up under a bridge with a bottle of vodka, yeah. never earn any money. Were and you scared? I wasn't really... I was just, I don't know, I was just driven. I yeah. think I was very driven. You just had to do it. You yes. Know, this was I wasn't did. very confident though. I knew that I did also things that weren't so, you know, to the point and, you know, I did performance, I did photography, but I just always had this genuine passion for what I was doing and I just kept doing it. And that's something I always try to tell also young filmmakers and especially women filmmakers, you just really have to do it. You have to, start working and and of course you can be angry about how the system is and i'm very angry and it's good to be angry but you also have to do the work and that means to create a lot to write a lot to film a lot to write down stories to try your things and find out what is your voice what 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 are the stories you want to tell and and for me it's like you know being an artist and filmmaker for me this is my whole life like i whenever i'm out like I'm always working, I'm always finding stories, I'm always thinking about them, I'm writing down, I'm also saying this is crap, you know, and start over. So it's like, it's really, I, I think you can only do this with a lot of passion and, and dedication. And for me, it's also, it was a, a way of survival. You know, my, my grandfather was a baker and he made bread. And I don't feel so different. I think making stories is like baking bread because bread is um, important for people, it's existential, and I think stories are too. You're a writer and a director. Do you feel like when you write the piece and you direct it, there's a certain connection you don't have as much as when you're just directing? How important is that writing element to the directing for you? It is very important. I start to see the story and hear the story, and it's it's very visual from the from the beginning and I couldn't it's hard for me to imagine like I did one Heidi I wrote for another director and I knew from the beginning I was only going to write it and that was okay but it was also not an original material it was a book that I was, I was adapting and with my own stuff I cannot imagine to give it in other hands it's like I have this my baby from the beginning and you're nurturing it and it does feel a little bit you know like yeah, you, you, you help something grow and you, you really want to bring it to, to the world and then you have to leave it. And it's always a very emotional moment for me when the film, for the first time I leave the theater and the film is just on its own, I always cry. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, I'm, you know, my child is off into the world. Well, thank you, Petra, for a wonderful interview. <laughs> thank you very much for this nice interview. And I brought you a little souvenir from oh, the movie. Thank you. I don't know what to say. This is very sweet. Yeah, it's a pussy card. <laughs> the divine order. Yes. <laughs> yeah, worthy. So, okay. Uh, okay. Is this like curling, Clint? Do we leave them there or do we take them off? I don't know. I think you okay, can hit you them in. Just leave them there. Oh, yeah. It could be cur like curling.